Welcome to Hedge Fund Tips with Tom Hayes. I'm Tom Hayes, live from New York City this week uh, for our 191st video cast, 181st podcast for the week ending June 15th, 2023. A lot to cover today. We'll do some quick photos. I know some people uh, like those. This is from Mimi and Annabelle's birthday celebration we did at the house this weekend. Um, uh, Annabelle turns nine actually this week coming up, but we have to go to Atlantic City for uh, Mimi's going to swim a mile in the bay for um, um, what they call uh, uh, something water. It's, it's a mile zones. Anyway, uh, open water is what, what happens and uh, pretty exciting. She's going to swim a mile, so we're going to be down there. And uh, Mimi turned 11, so pretty exciting time we had there. And let's see here. Uh, that's them with the cake. Everyone's back here getting ready to sing them happy birthday. And then uh, this was the slide we got, which was a big hit. They had a blast. The thing was like steep straight down, so that was a good time. Then I was pulling out and a turtle was uh, blocking my way uh, out of the driveway and someone sent me on Twitter that that's good luck for Alibaba. I think it's like a uh, Asian tradition, turtles are good luck. So, uh, you know, with it up, uh, it looks like about 12 bucks in the last couple of weeks, that's a good thing. Then today I went into New York City to do um, Yahoo Finance Live in studio. And as I was saying, this is a Vornado building, and I was talking to the producer, Taylor. The, every other floor in the building is Facebook, and she's like, they need more and more space. They're, they're basically not leaving. Uh, so Yahoo has like the fourth floor. And what was amazing, you can see they're upgrading the whole building. This is a Vornado building, uh, for those of you who don't know. This bullpen... I've been going in probably for about six months live. There was never a person in this bullpen. Uh, they were all work from home because it's a tech company. Today, every single desk was filled. Completely amazing to see. Complete game changer. Vornado building, Class A, New York City. Uh, what else do you want? And then uh, I went to pick up a couple suits at my tailor. And uh, I like this place called Pokey Works which should go public now that Kava just went public and uh, became a $5 billion money losing op uh, company today in the public markets. Anyway, um, this is the Vornado developments down in uh, around Penn Station. So you can see here, this is a serious class A building. That's another one that they have there. So I just wanted to kind of show you guys that, you know, it's amazing to go into Yahoo and, and say, I own a serious piece of this building through my ownership of Vernado. And um, this is another building down by the Penn Station developments. They're rehabbing uh, two Penn Plaza. Uh, this is the, um, looks like a, a terrace here above the entrance on that big tall black building. This building here, that's the Empire State Building so you can get a context of the location. This is another building. That's the uh, new Penn Station there. The old mail uh, post office got converted and uh, they have all of that. And then they've got this luxury building next door and you can see it there. And then what's right next door, the black building, the others were across the street here. That's Madison Square Garden. Talk about a location, Penn Station would be right here, that, that mail thing. And that's one, uh, two Penn Plaza that they're renovating. It used to be kind of a dingy building. Now it's looking like a brand new, exciting building. Of course, they control all the property right around Penn Station where everyone comes in from Long Island on the train. And they also control a lot of the uh, Class A real estate around Grand Central Station where everyone comes in from Westchester. I want to thank Jacob, uh, uh, Jacob Sonenshine for including me in his uh, Barron's article today on Generac. We're going to talk a little bit about gen the opportunity in Generac today. Um, uh, Yahoo put out a tweet saying uh, Tom's top two picks, Generac and PayPal. They're new positions that we have uh, from March during the uh, drawdown in uh, March when we added a lot of new capital, put a lot of new capital to work. Uh, our top two positions are still Alibaba and uh, I, I should get an Alibaba tattoo for heaven's sake uh, and, uh, and Cooper Standard, which by the way, what a day. I mean, we could just cut it short here. Alibaba was up... Uh, over 3% on uh, rate cuts. 
and Cooper Standard was up 12% today on three times average daily volume. So their average daily volume is 119,000. They did 350,000 shares. The stock was up 12%. That means some elephants are stepping into the room and that's good news. Next, next I wanna thank Lydia Moynihan for putting me in her article about the Kava IPO today. Uh, it doesn't get much better than that. My two favorite newspapers, Barron's and the New York Post, uh, to get in those this week was pretty cool. And then uh, got to join, want to thank Taylor Clothier, Diane King, Hall, Brad Smith, and Sydney Freed for having me on Yahoo in studio. We're going to listen to that to save us time. Basically, I go through kind of market overview, Fed reaction, et cetera, uh, the thesis behind uh, Generac and PayPal. And um, they also made me say some stocks that I wouldn't buy here, which is less valuable than the ones that I uh, own. Uh, but take a listen to this and we'll be right back. All right, let's dig deeper into shares of the fast casual restaurant Kava. That stock soaring, as Jared mentioned, up nearly 100% after its IPO this morning. The Mediterranean chain went public at $22 a share after raising its pricing expectations at the start of the week. For more market reaction on the news, we turn to Tom Hayes, Great Hill Capital Chairman and Managing Member. So, Tom, let's get let's dig into this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, you're going to get a bunch of puns with this one. I'm with you. Uh, so the appetite is there. Another one, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Two for one. Uh, but is this just kind of the brand new shiny thing? Uh, shiny objects we are in need of. It's been a long, long 18 months. The market's been dead for, for new IPOs. And I don't know if the buoyant market is better for Kava or Kava is better for the buoyant market. But I can tell you one thing. Those, those bankers are not going to be uh, laying on a beach in the Hamptons this summer. They're going to be back out on the street doing deals. There's probably a couple mm. dozen waiting to go. There's huge amount of demand. And the old saying go, when the ducks are quacking, feed them. And the ducks are quacking. You're seeing this thing up. There was indication of interest maybe $19, $20 or earlier this week. It uh, came out at 22. It's up almost 100%. They're not making any money, but it shows the pent-up demand from 18 months. And now with the Fed probably out of the way, I think risk is back on, and you're seeing it reflected today. We've broken through one of the tops that we had seen for the markets, for the S&P 500 at least, uh, and we've continued to move higher since the course of the end of May. Does this move that we're watching in Kava today signal that the environment is more favorable for IPOs to finally get into the fray and that it's game on now for more of the deals? It's absolutely game on. And this is not only going to be good for the markets, this is going to be good for investors. This is going to be good for bank earnings. You know, if you look at the big banks, they've kind of been lethargic, particularly since the mini crisis in March and April, if you remember. Now you've got this whole avenue of income that they haven't had for 18 months. Uh, these bankers have been playing a lot of golf. That game is over. <laughs> They're going to get back to it, and you're going to see deal after deal, you know, whether it's Fuego de Chao, whether it's Shutterstock, uh, many, many waiting, and I think they're going to get them out as quickly as possible. Which Fogo would be a re-IPO, if you will. Exactly. Uh, 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 almost a, um, oh my goodness, yes. when they recreate the movies out there again. Um, uh, anyway. A sequel, sequel, basically. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. Sequel yeah, yeah, IPO. Yeah, yeah. Um, but just uh, getting back to uh, Kava, like we talked a little bit about this offline. I mean, and, and we saw this, the path to profitability. I mean, last year their loss widened. Uh, so is this, you know, for Kava itself, so, sure the IPO environment now is hot or setting up to be hot. Uh, for Kava itself, is this just kind of a flash in the pan? Well, for the business, it's, it remains to be seen. You have people on two sides of the spectrum. One is this is the next Chipotle, which I'm a little bit skeptical about. Uh, the other is it's the next Potbelly, which could, could be not, not a good situation. Mm -hmm. I think it's somewhere in the middle, the truth. Uh, I think they're kind of in the sweet spot of healthy, fast, casual, reasonable prices, decent quality food, fresh every single day. So I think overall it was the right thing at the right time. But the, the name of the game is they control the supply of the stock, right? So you've got this 18 months of demand for stock. The bankers put out a small amount of supply. Everyone wants that supply. Supply. They want to get the pops. They want to. There's a performance chase now because managers are still in excessive cash. They're underweight the market. So when something like this comes out, everyone wants to get a piece so they can make these quick gains. I mean, we're talking about a lunch play right now, and I know we got to move on, but we're talking about a lunch play versus a company that you could see go public in Arm as well yeah. later on right. this year, perhaps. So. Yeah. If you kind of compare and contrast someone who's trying to get your lunch dollar or right. maybe your dinner buck yeah. versus a company that quite frankly, has much larger contracts that it could go after in tune of the multi-billion dollar type of level here. Yeah, this is a test of the water. I think, I think the bankers wanted to see 
uh, what is the climate like? Is the market as hot as we think? And what we found out is the market is hotter than we think. Mm -hmm. An excess amount of demand, a limited amount of supply, it's the perfect combination. You got to stock up 100%. So uh, expect these things to be oversubscribed. Leading into the big one of the year is going to be ARM. That's probably the most important IPO this year. So let's, oh, yeah. yeah, let's widen this out a little bit and yeah. let's uh, talk about the Fed and, yeah. and uh, the context, the market rallying and the context of the Fed's moves uh, yesterday. Uh, I mean, they they largely telegraphed what was going to happen. Like yeah. we were expecting this skip, if you yeah. will, uh, because especially when we see what the dot plot showed, there's no expectations of any rate cuts this year. Uh, is the market getting ahead of itself right now? No. Uh, Why? It's, I think the Fed is actually done. And Nick Timoreos, the, uh, the Fed whisperer from the Wall Street Journal, actually called Jerome Powell on his bluff yesterday. He said, listen, I see this dot plots at 5.6%. If you're so hawkish, why didn't you raise today? And Jay Powell said, because projections can change. Mm -hmm. And what everyone knows about the inflation numbers coming in, the, the base effects this summer, year on year, uh, the owner's equivalent rent is going to drop off a cliff in the month of July. And the next Fed meeting isn't until July 25th, 26th. So I think they're buying time to confirm that inflation is going to come down to the low threes, headline inflation. And if that's the case, they're going to skip again, and that's going to turn into a pause. They will keep rates elevated. There's no question about it because they want to keep the economy uh, from right. getting, getting too hot. But keep in mind, we've got 120% debt to GDP. The last thing you want is deflation. We have to run growth a little hot to inflate our way out of 120% debt to GDP like we did after World War II. Okay. So does that put you in the cut camp? Because you I said know. remain elevated, like, but I you mean, didn't say I am surprised. <laughs> you surprised me with you that. You didn't say <laughs> until when, Tom. Yeah. Uh, I, th I think a good analog for, for thinking about this would be uh, 1995. So they did do one or two cuts. I'm not in the cut camp. I think they're going to hold it at this level as long as they can. Yeah. But the Fed funds rate stayed between 5 and 6% from 1995 all the way till 2000. So they were able to keep rates elevated and the economy was able to grow above trend. And I think that's the formula they're looking for this time. A little bit above trend inflation, mm -hmm. definitely above trend nominal growth. We need that growth to, to bring down debt to GDP. Uh, and I think all the pieces are coming together. I am surprised by your call. I mean, I'm still in a state of shock. Also, going back to the 90s, I'm like, you don't look old enough to reflect on the 90s. I'm technically old, but I wasn't paying attention uh, enough to that. Uh, you know, so again, I'm surprised by this call. Um, and then, so do you? Is, so you're saying that the market is not getting ahead of itself? That it's just all it's game on in terms of market action now. I think it's game on in terms of market action. We're seeing pockets of, of some stocks that are overbought, some indicators that are overbought. You could see a little bit of chop, but I think as far as the IPO game, I think you're going to see a lot of supply in the next few months and you're going to see it quickly. All right. It's an IPO summer. Yes. Mm -hmm. With the time that we do have left, we've got to switch gears here. Let's talk a little earnings, why don't we? It's hard to believe, but we are about a month away from the second quarter earnings season. Yeah, I looked at the calendar of <laughs> one of the companies that I need to reach out to very briefly here and saw just how quickly that's coming. But anyway, we'll start to get some results sometime mid-July. Usually you can think about some of the airline stocks kind of kicking that off, giving us a precursor to the consumer and the services demand. Then we get banks and the list goes on. But if you were to wrap up or summarize what we saw in this Q1 earnings season yeah. and the guidance that we received as well, yeah. what does that set up? Mm. I think the setup is exactly like Q1. Expectations were extremely low, extremely pessimistic, negative 6.7% going into Q1. We finished out slightly below flat, negative 2%, well above expectations. Guidance was better than uh, expectations. And here we go into Q2 with everything that's happened. Expectations are negative 6.4%. Mm. Yeah. And, and at the same time, you have Atlanta GDP now right, hovering right around 2%. Yeah. So that old dog don't hunt, that, that doesn't line up, that doesn't sink. So I think we're set up for another positive surprise. And if you look at earnings at expectations for 2024, everyone kept saying when we were down, oh, they got to come down another 20%. Mm -hmm. They've been coming up the last four to right. eight weeks, 247 for 2024. So let me ask you then about sectors. What sectors do you think are going to be the standouts this time around? I think it's going to be the catch-up trade. So mm -hmm. everything that hasn't worked, I think tech's going to continue to do fine. It's going to do less well than it's done on a relative basis. 
And to Jared's point, we're going to start to see those groups that haven't participated start to participate moving forward. Okay, so is this a continuation of melt up or is this just an additional relief rally that we'll see this earnings season? Under the surface is where all the magic is going to happen. So. It, <laughs> hey, don't forget melt up. How many turn of phrases do you have for us today, Ms. Dondo? Let's see. I, I, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, so while, you know, even if you take a look, let's say the general indices only go up another 5% into year end, 5, 6, 7%. Uh, maybe they'll go up more good. and surprise us. There are going to be stocks under the surface that are going to be up 30, 40, 50% that haven't participated. Because if you remember, up till four weeks ago, the rally was driven by Magnificent Seven. Basically, sure. seven stocks drove most of the rally. It's starting to broaden out now. So you could see a subdued S&P index. So I wouldn't be like chasing the indices. Look for those things that were part of the 93% that had 0% year, uh, returns year to date mm -hmm. and opportunities moving forward. You're seeing the dollar weaken. Look at multinationals. They're going to benefit from a weak dollar from those foreign earnings. Okay, we're putting a bookmark. Tom Hayes, <laughs> stick around. Stay with us. We're going to come back to you after the break. There's a lot of uncertainty in the markets. Fed Chair Jerome Powell adding to that feeling after announcing a pause in interest rate hikes. Well, some of the uncertainty seems to be uh, in the rearview mirror. Powell, though, saying despite the pause in June, there may be more hikes ahead here to help manage some of the, the questions and give us some stock picks in this context is Tom Hayes, Great Hill Capital Chairman and Managing Member. So let's start with your picks. You, had a, you have a couple for us. Uh, I find both of them interesting. I'll Let's tell you what, Diane, pick. if I didn't shock you in the A block, I'm, I'm going to shock you right now. <laughs> no. uh, so I've got two stocks that are down 80% off mm. their 2021 peaks. Okay. And the first one is about as boring as boring I gets. know. <laughs> I know what it is. Tell the people. This is the Kleenex of home standby generators. It's called Generac. Riveting. And, uh, <laughs> you know, Generac has a 75% share in this business. The problem is, is during COVID, they built up their inventories right. too much because they, they couldn't get inventory. parts. Yeah. And it looks like in Q1 was the trough. So they're working through those inventories. They were at 1.7 times uh, normal inventories. They got down to 1.4 times. They think they're going to be normalized by early in the second half. They're going to be cash flow positive this year. And the thing about this company, first and foremost, because of the pessimism, they're trading at mm -hmm. uh, about 15 times. Their historic average multiple is about 30 times. So you're getting right. a huge discount uh, in terms of the growth. And the runway ahead is monstrous. They only have 6% penetration. And you could say, well, you know, does it get saturated at some, some point? People don't buy two generators for their house. Right. What they find is in the, the top states where they have the most penetration above 10%, yeah. they consistently have the biggest growth rate because what happens is everyone has a generator, so everyone wants a generator. Whereas in the markets where they're underpenetrated, they say, well, none of my friends have a generator, so what do I need a generator for? Mm -hmm. uh, this, this is going to continue. This company is, it could be, over the next 12 to 24 months, we think a double after so, being down 80%. And that's because of it being down 80%. So yeah. is this also just like a summer play because of, I don't know, potential for just demand, and, uh, power outages, et cetera? Is that what... Diane, part of this? I'm going to bring you in as an analyst at our fund because you, you hit the nail on the head. This company does well on the basis of weather events, and we just entered hurricane season from June through September. You get the power outages. And by the way, our grid has been underinvested for so many years uh, that what you're seeing is, you know, when I was growing up, power outage was an hour, 30 minutes. Yeah. Now, in some cases, they're three days, four days, five days. In Texas, yeah. And, and when that happens, even in Connecticut, it's, it's, it's crazy. When that happens... Everyone goes out and buys a generator. So uh, we're expecting above average weather events for the next four months. And if that's the case, that's going to be a further tailwind for Generac. Uh, we're going to see some acceleration. Uh, with rates lower, we're going to see uh, the housing market start to come back, home building come back. That helps Generac as well. So there's a lot of pent-up demand with all the millennials, the young folks like you. 33, housing and family formation. You all are buying houses now that rates moderate. You're going to jump on that. You're going to want a generator, and that's what's going to come. He's the millennial. You find me a I'm bank Gen that's going to give me a loan, <laughs> we can talk. Uh, I also got to talk about PayPal, though. You talk about millennials. Of course, this is like the Venmo season, if you mm -hmm. will. Summertime, you're out with your friends. Mm -hmm. You pay for this pizza. I'll hit you back with that money later on. Let's talk about PayPal here, yeah. because that's one of your other picks on the day. Yeah, and this is uh, probably one of the most hated stocks right now. <laughs> Again, down 80%. Look, they've got 435 million users uh, around the world. That's mind-boggling. Three billion transactions. Uh, so why is everyone uh, all up in arms? Number one, uh, obviously, they got ahead of themselves during COVID. The, the valuations were, were crazy. 
Uh, right now, it's trading at 11 times forward earnings compared to its average historic mm -hmm. multiple of 33 times. Yeah. Uh, this thing is a monster. So what happened is they did this acquisition called Braintree. And Braintree really ramped up the volume, but their margins are lower because you don't have as much juice as you have on the normal PayPal transactions. So analysts got worried that you were having margin contraction, but you were having it's okay to have margin contraction as long as the bottom line keeps going up. And what they wanted it, they wanted it to go up at a certain percentage right. all the time. I'll take tons of extra volume as long as the bottom line goes up. And that's, that's going to continue to happen. You have two other things. Dan Shulman is stepping mm -hmm. down before right. the end of the year. So you have leadership uncertainty that will get resolved. They'll have someone good. And then you've got an activist also to catalyze with Elliott in the stock, Elliott Management. So they, mm -hmm. they uh, are good at extracting value. So I think there are a lot of things that can go right while everyone's looking at what can go wrong. They are, unless, uh, for lack of a better way of expressing it, the what could go wrong plays that you have, yeah. uh, the ones that I guess you're not a fan of. Uh, let's start with Oracle, which surprised yeah. me. You're going against the grain here. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's up on the day, uh, continuing to extend its advance. Yeah. Explain your thinking here. Okay, so Oracle and Lily, I mean, you know, I, I never, uh, we're not short these stocks, so let's, let's okay. be clear about sure. that. Yeah. Uh, I don't think this is the time to be short aggressively anything. Uh, however, we like things that are on sale. We don't like things that are marked up. And we think that after Oracle's earnings, they're now trading about four turns above their average historic multiple. They usually trade at 18, they're trading 22. And we just say, okay, let this thing breathe. It's a great quality business. We get that their cloud is growing, yeah. but uh, see if there's a pullback before you get interested. Don't, you don't need to chase it up here after earnings is our view. Yeah, and then Lilly as well, one of the other picks here, Eli Lilly. Um, similar multiple issue that you're taking? Yeah, it's certainly a multiple issue. It's uh, trading at 51 times, I think, relative to its average of 25 times. Uh -huh. And it's on the hype around Manjaro. So That's what have, I was going to say. Yeah. It has, I'm sorry to jump in. <laughs> yeah, it yeah. has Manjaro. Like, how would you go against this? I mean, these weight loss drugs are all the craze right now. Yeah, there's no, there's no question. But uh, obviously, they have competition from Ozempic and Wagovi. And the stock has moved up dramatically in anticipation of the approval for weight loss usage. Right now, it's being written off label. But they want to get the weight loss usage. So two things could happen. Number one, you could get that approval, and it's to sell the news because it's run up so right. much. Or number two, God forbid, which I think is very low probability, what if you didn't get that approval and it's mm. already priced that in? So I think, you know, again, it, I think the long-term runway is certainly good, Diane. I agree with you, but I don't want to pay up two times its average multiple. Uh, so for me, they're just a, a pass for okay. now. It's not a, they're not great. They're both great businesses, but they're okay. a little rich for me right now, just today. Understand, we need a sale. Yeah. All right, we like that. We like a sale. Yeah. All right, Tom Hayes, our thanks to you so much for this thanks, great Diane. conversation thanks, Brad. today. Appreciate it. And we're back. So that's kind of the overview. We can move on. Want to quickly uh, go to Phil Yin. Always does a great interview over at CGTN. And also thank Camilia Kilowan for having me on. So we're going to listen to this real quick. More on what this means for the uh, U.S. economy or for that matter, the global economy. Thomas Hayes, founder, chairman, managing member of Great Hill Capital. Uh, good to see you. Uh, I love having you on the show, especially on days like this, because... Uh, First of all, they should really kill these press conferences because had he just made the decision and then stopped talking, I think the markets would have been fine. But then he started talking, giving this idea or hinting that there could be two more rate hikes. And I don't understand the purpose of that other than to ruin the celebration, if you want to call it that, for lack of a better word. Why say that? Well, this was a hawkish skip. And thanks for having me, Phil. I love coming on with you. Uh, the idea here is they need to continue to anchor long-term inflation expectations. So we believe the Fed is done. And why do we believe the Fed is done? Because the base effects from last year are at their most pronounced for the June data, which will be reported in July before the, the meeting on the 25th and 26th. And specifically, the key component in that is owner's equivalent rent. And I'm sure you've looked at the Redfin numbers and the Zillow numbers. They're, they're really declining. And that's about a third of the weight in CPI. Those numbers are going to give them more than enough cover to skip again in G July, which is going to lead to a pause where they'll so keep rates when, elevated when, through the end of the year. When they say data dependent, are you referring the data they're looking at is this uh, uh, owner's equivalent rent or is the data used cars and the price of eggs. Which one is it? Because all the numbers that we've seen has seen a significant pullback, albeit though the caveat is I'm hearing used car prices are 
inching forward again, and some other things, but it sounds like to me that that's not the data they're looking at. Well, it, the key is the weight, and they assign uh, close to 40% weight on owner's equivalent rent. So that's going to be a key component, and if we look at the base effects, that's going to be very positive. We're going to see a three-handle on headline inflation next month, and, and it could be even at low threes, and that's really going to change sentiment around inflation, around inflation expectations, and really give the Fed cover to pause yet again. And, and, uh, and this is very constructive. So the dot plot is what spooked everyone, uh, where I think what you're seeing is Powell has now moved more dovish than his colleagues. This was a concession where uh, he would say, let's skip, let's see more data come in. He's worried about the banking instability that we saw a few months ago. He doesn't want to break more things. I think they put two banks under that didn't need to go under, uh, of the four that did go under. And uh, uh, the dot plot is basically saying there's more there if we need it, but more likely than not, we're not okay, going so to need it. As a matter of fact, Nick Timoreo, so the Wall Street Journal, called him on that in the press conference. He said, if you're all so hawkish, why didn't you just hike and pull the Band-Aid off today? And he kind of fumbled and said, well, projections can always change. But it, it, isn't it also a credibility issue? They've been saying, we're fighting inflation, we're fighting inflation, we're fighting inflation. Okay, so inflation has come down. I think the last number I saw was sort of around 4%, depending on which number you look at. And I get it, but I still stand by the fact that 2% is not a realistic number if you want your economy to be growing at the pace it's growing at. The only way that 2% makes sense is if you don't want your economy to grow at, at all. So he's stuck. He's put himself into this position where he has to have the credibility to say that we're going to keep fighting inflation or at least or at least uh, insinuate that you are. Yeah. And, and to your point exactly, Phil, 2% inflation would be a complete disaster when you have debt to GDP at 120%. The only way to bring that down is the way we did it uh, post-World War II, uh, which is to run inflation hot and run, run nominal growth hot for the next three to five years. Uh, and, and we did it from 48 to 53, brought, it, brought uh, debt to GDP from 120 down to 63. We'll do the same thing this time. We need growth. We need above trend inflation. Three, three and a half is a, is a right. good level. So look, we've got markets hitting near new highs in Europe. We've got near new highs in, in, in Japan and parts of Asia. We have the, the S&P inching forward to breaking out. We've got a number of NASDAQ stocks very close, if not at all-time highs. The markets somehow kind of guess this was all going to happen months ago. We've been, we've been on a stealth rally for the past few months. Where do we go from here? We're at a sea change. With the Fed out of the way, what you're going to start to see is a resumption of the downtrend in the dollar, which began in October and was interrupted in the, in the last month in anticipation of the debt negotiations. You had a bid for safety in the dollar. You had a counter trend rally. Now that resumption is going to go downward, and that favors a new group of stocks. So we've been led by tech, the Magnificent Seven that's driven 90% of the rally. Now we're going to see the other 93% of the S&P start to participate. Those 93% of stocks have actually performed 0% year to date. It's those seven or eight stocks that have driven all of the gains. And now we're going to get to the 93%. So first off, uh, multinationals that get more than 50% of their revenues abroad, they're going to benefit from a weaker dollar. Emerging markets in China are going to start to get bid materially. Uh, biotech, the risk on trade as rates now stabilize and we can quantify, uh, you're going to see money move back into risk. Excellent. And then, and then finally, interest rate sensitive REITs will start to get bid and small caps will benefit like from it. bank stability. Like so you're saying there's hope that the rest of us might see our portfolios finally bounce because we've got FOMO on the ones that we already missed. Next time we're going to get some more stock picks from you. Uh, Thomas Hayes, good to see you again. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. And we're back. Uh, so that's really the overview. I want to thank uh, Ali Sisnar for having me, uh, Ali Sinar, uh, for having me on Bloomberg HT. We got Ali Sinar, C-I-N-A-R, for having me on Bloomberg HT out of the Washington, D.C. headquarters did this one remote and we have an English version there. So you definitely want to check that out uh, when you have time. And I know last time I was speaking in a female Turkish voice, it wasn't very useful for the listeners here in the United States, uh, but this one certainly was. And then I want to thank, um, so first off, Ali Sinar, and I want to thank um, Mike Teak and Ann Berry for having me on public.
This was before the Fed meeting. And by the way, really good news. We had expected to get a three handle on headline inflation. They beat expectations, but it came in at 4.0 versus 3.9. Uh, I think it's going to be low threes, as I said, in Yahoo today in uh, the June numbers uh, that come out early July, well before the Fed meeting. So that should keep the Fed on pause. And that's the name of the game. So the dollar keeps going down, bonds get bid, and that's been the trend. I uh, also want to thank Anuran Mitra for including me in his article on Seeking Alpha after the Fed decision yesterday. And the quote of the week, investing is the greatest business in the world because you never have to swing. You stand at the plate, the pitcher throws you uh, General, General Motors at 47, U.S. Steel at 39, and no one calls a strike on you. There's no penalty except opportunity. All day you wait for the pitch you like. Then when the fielders are asleep, you set up and you hit it. That's from Warren Buffett. Um, with all the excitement, I want to just go through some of our indicators just to give you an idea of where we are. So while we seem overbought, uh, keep in mind when these things come off heart attacks, they can just persist for a long time and you can go straight up. So yes, a lot of things are overbought and yes, we can keep going. And I've been saying that the last two weeks and that's what's been happening. Um, here's that uh, NDX 1% EMA advanced decline ratio. It's still uh, really low here, like in 2016, and that was just the beginning of a multi-year rally. Same in 2011, 2012. Uh, sounds like they got a concert going across the street in Bryant Park while I'm recording this, so we'll do our best. Um, okay, uh, NASDAQ cumulative volume ratio, same thing. It's getting up there, but it can keep going. Uh, high, low, same thing, not yet at extremes. Um, up, down, on balance volume. It's, it's elevated, no, no question, but it can, can, these indicators can stay pinned. We talked about Vernado. Here's the real estate coming off the heart attack death mat, and it's just getting started. And, and as you see, when these just get started, they, there's a lot of runway left in them. Uh, so there's some groups that are more elevated than others. This is a Dow Intermediate Term Breath Momentum. This has a long way to go before we have anything to worry about. Uh, mid cap, same thing, more opportunity there. NASDAQ is getting a little bit, you know, I, I just think they're going to perform less well. I wouldn't really get aggressively short anything, but here's the summation index on the SPX. This is kind of a lower level. We can keep pushing higher here as people, more and more people get forced out of their T-bills and get forced back into the market after missing the first 25%, uh, which we, you guys all remember very well in October. I said, if you're not buying stocks here, uh, what the hell are you doing? Let's get, you know, get out of the business. And uh, sure enough, it's been basically straight up since with some volatility along the way. Dow Jones, PMO by all. I think the Dow's got a little more juice here. SPX is getting up there. So we may be due for a little bit of consolidation, sideways chop, but uh, we could also just pin and just really hurt the bears. And that's what the market likes to do, cause the most pain to the most amount of people. And we're going to talk about how people are positioned and they're still too bearish. And that's why it's going to just, you're going to see, pan what you're seeing today is panic buying. And uh, maybe it's a short term top, but I think we're, we're going to push higher through year end. And as I said in Yahoo, it, all the magic is going to happen under the service. Don't chase the indices. Look for what's, what hasn't yet participated that's, that's high quality that's going to. Bullish percent S&P, this has room. There's room to go here. And, um, and I think it's going to force more and more people in against their will. NAS, uh, NASDAQ, McClellan, Summation, this is nowhere near extreme. I mean, this is really just getting off the mat like 15, 16, and uh, 11, 12. Uh, uh, New York uh, NYSE McClellan summation, same thing. It's, it's just getting off the mat. So I think it can do a lot more pain to the bears. Uh, skew we discussed last week, and um, this is coming off the boil because of the debt ceiling. That's why we think it's different. Uh, and the VIX continues to trend down. I, I, there were so many people that kept sending me charts. Oh, this is in an uptrend when we were here and I was telling everyone to buy in October. And I said, that's for now. And sure enough, it broke that quote unquote silly uptrend. Moving right along, some stuff from RBC. Thanks to my buddy over there. Uh, percentage of stocks above the 50 and 200 day moving averages. That's for the S&P 500. Uh, and as you can see, there's, there's room to press higher here as there is uh, in, the, in the nascent stages of any rally. VIX continues to come down. Bullish sentiment is nowhere near extreme yet. It will be. It's getting there. But uh, I think you got to pin more people to the wall. Ten-year yield is coming down. This is from a couple of days ago, so it's dropped more. The dollars dropped more. Um, that's rolling back over. Remember, this was driven by the debt ceiling, bid to safety, roll over. We talked about that many times. 
Uh, other currencies are getting bid. Natural gas starting to look interesting. If you're forced to be in energy stocks, I'd be looking at natural gas stocks, and we've talked about many of them. Um, copper is interesting on the China play. Um, you know, Jacob uh, Sonenshine put out an article on Freeport Mac. I agree with him if you're going to play with it, but I, I, I just don't think those are high quality businesses. But if you have to be in the space, copper is going to move. I'd rather just play it through owning China, or if you're too scared to own uh, Chinese stocks, own Nike uh, and, and get the play there. Here's the uh, S&P sector's relative performance to the S&P. So you want to be looking at uh, those that have underperformed an opportunity. I think financials, and I said today on Kava, on Yahoo Finance, that uh, a whole source of income that has been uh, non-existent for the major banks is now coming back, which is investment banking. The, they're going to rush all these IPOs out while the market's hot, and they're going to make tons and tons of money. So uh, the companies like Goldman, JP Morgan, Bank of America, we own Bank of America, by the way. And even some of the regionals will get bid, and they've been the underperformer. That's part of the 93% that up until four weeks ago wasn't really participating. That's where you're going to get your juice into year end. Even utilities, interest rate sensitive, we covered last week communication services, some aspects. Staples, they've underperformed. I think there's limited opportunity there. A lot of them have really high multiples, but I have been noticing like Clorox, um, maybe Church and Dwight, but definitely um, Kraft Heinz. There's a few of them that are starting to get interesting. Healthcare is underperformed, so there may be some opportunity there and some of the insurers that got beat down. Why did they get beat down? Because more and more people are getting back to getting procedures now that COVID's over. UNH came out and said that this week. The stock was down 7% in a day. That's what caused the Dow rollover yesterday more than the Fed. Uh, but we're playing that through Baxter, which we've talked about many times. Uh, we don't want to hope that the costs are less than anticipated. We want to hope that they're more than anticipated and they sell a ton of medical devices and everything related to uh, healthcare visits. So we're excited about that. Industrials we've talked about, obviously small caps. Materials uh, is, is Jacob's article. Uh, not my cup of tea, but materials is kind of like 3M because they have that type of exposure. Uh, and some of those stocks are more interesting than maybe uh, Freeport, but Freeport will definitely work. Energy, if you got to be in it, I think natural gas or the servicers like the Schlumbergers, the uh, National Oil Well Varco, et cetera. All this is obviously opinion, not advice. Technology is dramatically outperformed, so we think that they'll continue to perform, but I think relatively underperform to some of these laggards. Discretionary and retail, everyone hates. I think those can start to get bid. I think the consumer is going to surprise the upside as they always do. Never bet against the U.S. consumer. Uh, and then here are some other stocks that they're just talking about getting to these Fibonacci levels and maybe do for a pause. Um, I think actually a lot of them have broken through in the last couple of days. So, so much for that. But uh, here's Nike. Um, Cigna looks kind of cheap. Pfizer looks okay. Uh, this looks a little overdone. Eli Lilly I talked about on Yahoo um etc so there's uh there's stuff to do here's the cooper standard uh investor presentation from yesterday you know it's interesting the stock's up 12 percent today i don't know if it's because of this investor presentation but i mean it's definitely interesting i mean they talk about this is the most important thing in my view this is why i bought the stock laser focus on return on invested capital achieving and sustaining Double digit return on invested capital. That's monster. Strong revenue growth outlook, increasing global light vehicle production and higher content per vehicle. That's key as you move into uh, EVs. And we're going to talk about that. And uh, profit margin inflection, improved fixed cost structure, increasing production volumes and enhanced commercial agreements. The operating leverage, that was our thesis last May when we put it out on the podcast. And now it's up almost triple is... Um, uh, is, is, is the opportunity here. So the volumes are starting to come in. Uh, people are surprised by how, mu how much demand there is for new cars. We've been saying it's coming. And you can see here their core lines, the number one in ceiling solutions. It's an $8.4 billion market. They've got 16% of it. Then number two is fluid handling solutions, 8 billion. They've got 14% of that, plenty of room to grow. Their business breakdown, 56% in North America. 4% in South America, so 60% there, 20% EU, and 19% and Asia Pacific. They list all the companies that they do. Uh, they also have Tesla, but they're not allowed to use their, their um, uh, trademark for some reason, but uh, they're a customer as well. Leveraging manufacturing materials in adjacent uh, markets. 
So this Fortrex uh, technology is key. Uh, they're able to get off rubber-based and uh, uh, petro-based and start to diversify along those uh, lines and be climate friendly and all that stuff. So that's a good thing. And <laughs> here we go. Harness oh, maybe this was it. Harnessing the power of digital analytics and AI. Maybe they're up 12% because they put the words AI in their pitch deck yesterday, but you can go through this. Uh, this is very interesting. EV transition increasing OEM complexity and cost per vehicle growth for Cooper Standard. So this is dynamic sealing, which was the cheapest. Now it's moving to static sealing, which adds complexity. And then finally is frameless sealing, which is the highest complexity and specialty where they make a ton of money per car. And as you can see from internal combustion uh, through hybrid, through battery electric vehicles, the battery electric vehicles, they actually go from eight parts per car to 20 parts per car. And that increases their margin on profits by 20% per vehicle, which is pretty exciting as you see more and more penetration. Our thesis was predicated on, you know, 2017 run rates, which was all ICE. So this is just gonna, <clears throat> going to be whipped cream moving forward. Developing, okay, industry, blah, 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 lots of awards. Revolutionary integrated fluid systems, increasing value. What does that mean? It increases the cost per vehicle opportunity, 14 patents pending. So the one thing that was never in my thesis was a dramatic increase in margin. And, um, you know, my, my basic thesis was car volumes are going to come back. The operating leverage is there. They're going to make money like they did in 2017. Uh, never did I imagine they'd be able to successfully cut so many costs, number one, and then number two, increase their top line so dramatically from renegotiating the contracts, but also from increasing their sophistication, which increases their moat in the business, which makes them way more than a commodity, which is why they're a number one supplier for, for the, the major OEMs like Ford and GM, et cetera. And they receive all these awards and uh, it shows their uh, uh, patented products with the Fortrex. Uh, with the weight reduction, advantage in the carbon footprint, moving away from the rubber and petrol base uh, type of things. And this is uh, very, very constructive stuff. So, um, you know, they show how they, they've taken $479 million of costs out of the business. We're going to start to see the benefits of that now that the volume production's up, the contracts are renegotiated, and the production is starting to jump. Um, they're going to grow. 8%, 5% faster than the general car mo market in terms of compound annual growth rate. And they don't need much uh, annual growth in order for that operating leverage and just to kick right to the bottom line. So very exciting stuff here and the stock reflects it today and it looks like it got a lot of people in. Here's another indicator, NASDAQ stocks above the 200 day moving average. So on the one hand, it's like, wow, we, NASDAQ's had like, uh, quite a bit of move. On the other hand, it shows there's just dramatic opportunity under the surface beyond you know, 10 or 15 stocks that have been the first part of the rally, you know, you got another 85 of the NASDAQ 100 that are going to be the second part of the rally that are going to shoot up high. Um, moving right along, we've got uh, uh, rents keep rising, but more slowly, it's good for inflation. We've been talking about that speaks to owner's equivalent rent that we started to see this month um, uh, and we'll continue to see over the summer, I think most dramatically next month before the second meeting, which will turn the skip to a pause and then they'll keep it elevated as we discussed on Yahoo. Tech stocks are in a 1995 moment and poised to boom on the AI revolution, Wedbush says. I agree 100%, similar rate environment, similar everything environment. Uh, I think we could see a four to five year runway. Uh, new study ranks New York as America's best city of 2023. Literally, you could not say that six months ago. Everything's turning the corner. I mean, the, the streets are so packed with pedestrians just walking around with staggering driving. It, it, New York City is back. Let me just tell you that right now. And the best buildings in the best city in the world are always going to have value. This is just happening much quicker than I thought it would. Uh, and uh, I'm seeing it right before my eyes. New York office occupancy breaks 50% above 50% for the first time since the pandemic hit. So they're doing much better than uh, many other cities. And that's all coming back. I could not believe what I saw at Yahoo because Yahoo is has a very progressive culture about it and like you know up until last month they were checking vaccine cards to go into the studio i mean covid's been over for two years 
And that's just the nature. And there was literally no one in the office. It was all about work from home. Uh, it was all about that flexibility. And um, the game has just changed. They didn't ask me for uh, to, to check anything. They, everyone was back at their desks. Uh, it was a Vernado building. It made me very happy. So that's all you need to know. Uh, PPI plunges more than expected. So both PPI and CPI. ASOS, we've got a small position we've talked about a couple of times. Uh, becomes a takeover target after details of a billion dollar bid emerge. It's trading at around 400 million pounds. So a billion would be two and a half. It's a major player in the retail business, a multi-billionaire. The guy's worth uh, seven or eight billion. He's after it, uh, but uh, too late because they return to profitability. Uh, that article will come up. Uh, here's an article of uh, Messi was on Alibaba Taobao live show. Messi is like the most popular soccer, soccer player in the world. He's not on Tencent. He's not on JD. He's on Alibaba's platform. Why? Because it's the biggest and the best and the most incredible. Uh, renters are about to get the upper hand. Rents are going down. That'll that'll uh, lock you know keep the Fed out of the out of the picture. ASOS turnaround shows progress with return to profit. I think ASOS was up a bunch today as well. Uh, ASO. Uh, it's just a way for me to play the value trade in um, UK in addition to Rolls Royce. Uh, so yeah, uh, ASOS was up sixteen uh, percent today. So that's good. Uh, they're they're actually making things happen. My biggest trepidation, which is why I didn't pitch this thing hard and talk about it publicly hard, is because um, oh here it is. Uh, retailer elicited takeover interest. ASOS received an approach from. Turkish online retailer Trendall, backed by Alibaba, um, at a price between, so it would have been 10 to 12 US dollars. It's at $4.80 if you're uh, doing the over the counter stock. Um, so that, that wouldn't be bad. The uh, multi billionaire, he's got like 6% of the company. He moved it up to 8 or 9% of the company. So I guess he's getting active. Uh, but it looks like the CEO's uh, doing a good job. I was a little skeptical because he's a McKinsey guy, and sometimes they're just empty suits with a lot of ideas and no um, kind of do it attitude. Roll up your sleeves, get your sleeves dirty, your fingernails dirty. They're too used to uh, strategizing and talking and having meetings versus doing. But it looks like he's getting stuff done, uh, and that's that's a really positive thing to see. That was my big trepidation in getting into the position, but I. You know, the founder who built the business was still on the board, and I figured if the guy screwed up enough, he would come back and fix it. And uh, seems like uh, seems like the guy I was I was a little leery of is is doing the job right. So that's that's really good news. Uh, here shows multiples uh, U.S. tech companies versus Alibaba. Alibaba's got the lowest multiple. Alibaba's got the highest potential in my view. What you pay and what you get, uh, that's the key in value investing. China's inflation problem, it has none, which means they can put the pedal to the metal on stimulus. And that's why their markets were up overnight, because not only did they cut short rates earlier in the week, they cut one-year rates, lending rates uh, overnight, and they had an emergency meeting, how they're going to you know, jam full of stimulus. And I think it's just the perfect combination of uh, duration in terms of letting the patient heal and overloading them with medicine on top of it to uh, really make the patient happy. And I think it's going to just absolutely gallop in the second half here and dramatically outperform on a relative basis. U.S. to allow South Korea, Taiwan chip makers to keep operations in China. This is kind of an olive branch ahead of the Blinken meeting. He's flying over to see uh, Xi Jinping or the, uh, his equivalent in China. And China tech groups suffer as foreign investors take flight. These are the type of headlines that you see near bottoms. And um, I just love the absolute acute pessimism as the stock goes up. And that's that's uh, what you want to see. You want to see bad headlines and good price action. You know, for the last 12 months, we've had bad headlines and bad price action. Now we're getting bad headlines and good price action. And eventually opinion follows trend. Even Ken Griffith of Citadel is optimistic on growth in China. He's been pessimistic on everything else. China's top broker sees earnings relief for Hong Kong stocks. Uh, so he's uh, seeing uh, estimates improve over the back half. China writers for stimulus. So more and more. What to watch is Blinken heads to China to reset ties. Microsoft's co-founder Bill Gates will reportedly meet China Xi this week. So basically you have Jamie Dimon going over. You have uh, the lady from Citibank. You have uh, the guy who does all the handbags um, um, in uh, Europe. 
the richest, second richest guy in the world. All of them are going, you know, if the governments can't get along, big business will go over and fix things because they want to make money. And, um, and that's what's happening. And uh, sooner or later, it's, uh, first business will lead and then the government will finally figure it out when they're told what to do. Uh, and everything will be back to normal. It's by the rumor time for Chinese markets with stimulus on the way. Uh, China, China's stimulus trade gains momentum as stocks and yuan. Okay, China opens a new era of proactive easing. So every single positive headline is matched with negative, which means there's disbelief and we've gone through that sentiment um, uh, model, the, the MAMIS model many, many times. This is, we're, we're in disbelief here and then we're gonna go to acceptance after the thing is over 200 bucks. So China holds urgent meetings on economy with business leaders. So I'm just giving you a tenor of what's happening. Alibaba rise after China's central bank cuts in another interest rate. Uh, China government purportedly calls urgent meeting with business leader and economists on how to reboot economy. Ah, this is interesting today. Alibaba to launch local versions of its China e-commerce site in Europe. So this is not just um, AliExpress, which lists goods that come from China and are shipped to Europe. This is for um, T-Mall in Europe would focus on selling local brands to local shoppers. In other words, becoming the Amazon of Europe. So that's just a free option on top of, uh, on top of having uh, everything that we expect in China. So to have a uh, compete with Amazon in Europe is a big, big deal because Amazon really hasn't got the live streaming down and the Chinese have that mastered live streaming selling. This is from Seth Goldman. Earnings estimates are tracking higher, outpacing downgrades for the first time since 2021. Uh, that's a good thing. Seth Goldman, Golden, I love this as well. Let's play catch up. So uh, <laughs> this is hysterical. Um, look how opinion follows trend. They took their Goldman takes that took their year end target from 4,000 to 4,500. Why? Because the market is going up in the last few weeks. Evercore from 4,150 to 4,450. Royal Bank of Canada, they're always more conservative, 4,100 to 4,250. They're going to have to take it up again now. I think we closed at, what, 4,425 today. And Bank of America took it from 4,000 to 4,300. They've been the most bearish. They were, they were, they were the, the loudest, other than Mike Wilson over at Morgan Stanley, when we were at 3,600 saying we were going down another 20, 20%. And we were saying, if you're not buying here, find another business. What the hell are we doing? Uh, so uh, they're still too bearish and they're wrong and uh, now they've got uh, major career risk. Here's from Ryan Dietrich, when the S&P makes a new 52 week high after a year without one, the higher, higher rate a year later is 15 out of 15 times, went up 20% from a bear low, up a year later 20, uh, 12 out of 13 times, both up about 17% on average a year later and both happened recently. So he does this quantitative analysis, average is 17% a year later, and averages 17.4 uh, and 17.7. So there you go. Uh, when doves cry, stock market and sentiment results. That's our article of the week. Uh, those expecting a dovish skip at the Fed meeting may have been surprised by an increase in the expected terminal rate presented in the dot plot yesterday. The FOMC took the terminal rate projections from uh, up to 5.6% from 5.1%, implying two more hikes. Nick Timoreo, so the Wall, the Wall Street Journal Fed whisperer, called their bluff in the press conference and asked why, if they're so damn hawkish, didn't they simply pull the Band-Aid off and hike this meeting? And Powell's general tenor was that the July is a live meeting, but projections could change, i.e. the dot plot is designed to anchor inflation expectations, not kill inflation, meaning we're BSing you. Now, now that expectations are back at 2018 levels, I would say it's working. So here's the five-year inflation break-evens at 215. Uh, that's back to 2018 levels. All this hawk talk is working great. Now they can pause. They can keep rates elevated to slow the economy like 95 to 99 and off to the races. Here we go. Now, the biggest risk is no longer inflation moving forward. The biggest risk is deflation. You cannot have a debt to GDP at 120% and enter deflation. It would be devastating. The only play is to inflate your way out of it and run inflation above 3% for three to five years, as we did following World War II. And we had similar debt levels. For those of you who are new, they took uh, debt to GDP from 120 down to 63 in five years, letting inflation run hot. Uh, and nominal growth, that's the most important thing. Growth, growth, growth. Okay, here's all the media. We've gone through it. Now, 
Last week I said, well, quote, while I wouldn't be surprised by some short-term market consolidation, I also wouldn't be playing for it, end quote. Quite a few names are overbought and many of the short-term indicators I look at point toward taking a breather. However, at the same time, when I see positioning and sentiment so low, I remain open-minded to the idea we could stay pinned for some time and push more people into the market against their will. Uh, thanks to my friend Adam also for sending over great uh, information. And my friend Rick, you, you all know who you are and, um, and many others. This Tuesday, uh, and Zach, of course, uh, Bank of America published its monthly fund manager survey. I posted a summary here. Here were the five key points. Number one, this is after 25% rally off the lows, by the way. Only 15% of managers expect stronger economic growth. These are levels not seen since the pandemic lows, the great financial crisis lows, and the tech rec lows in 2001. You can't make this stuff up. Managers are taking the least amount of risk in their portfolios since early in the 2009 recovery. Remember this? Rally, check back. This is halfway through the year. Same exact thing here, and it went straight up without everyone. And most people got in the, uh, in 2010 after the market was already up uh, 80, 90 percent, and they missed the whole damn thing. And I think we're going to see similar type of situations here. Uh, maybe not 80, 90 percent, but we've, you know, in individual stocks for damn sure. Uh, equity allocations are still 2.1 standard deviations below their long term average. That's the last 20 year average, despite a 25 percent rebound off the October lows. Uh, Mind boggling. Man this is from Tuesday, ladies and gentlemen. This is not three weeks ago when people were pessimistic about the debt ceiling. This is this week. And people are still, I mean, the amount of panic buying that we have to see for these people is going to be staggering. And we saw a taste of it today. So, um, so you know, just my experience, when you get these type of really panic buy days, the next, which forced everyone in, the next day they should flush them a little bit because the hands are so weak. But um, it doesn't matter. We know under the surface is where the magic is going to happen. Now, um, managers remain overweight bonds and underweight equities relative to their 20 year average. I mean, look at this, it's just staggering. Underweight, what are they most underweight? Equities and REITs. Okay, so there's your Vernado. And what are they most overweight? Bonds and healthcare. So, you know, we know what to do. And five, this one I love the most the most crowded trades are long big tech and short China. We expect the relative performance to flip. Big tech will underperform long China in the second half, and I think by orders of magnitude today. Okay, so we went through that. We covered Generac. You can read that yourself. We covered PayPal. Uh, now on to the shorter term view. So here are some of the extreme. You know, this bullish percent is getting pretty, uh, the retail folks are getting giddy, but this can stay pinned for a while. Same with the fear and greed index at 81 and the National Association of Active Investment Managers at 90%. So yeah, there's some froth coming in, but there's still, still a lot to do under the surface. I uh, just want to see, yeah, pessimism back down in China. Here's the cash levels, ladies and gentlemen. This is why I think it's going to cause more pain to the bears and just rip their faces off because they're still hidden under the bunker and the markets keep going up and they are absolutely panicking and you're going to see panic buying like nobody's business. Um, they can't even bring themselves to buy equities. They're buying alternatives um, because they're so cautious. Here's the overweight bonds, most since March of 2009, which was a once in a hundred year low. Um, so you can just see it um, there. Moving right along, insider buying in advanced auto parts. That's one that we've covered tangentially in the last couple of weeks. We don't own it. If we had to be in the auto parts retailers, we would. We don't have to be in it. And there's nothing we want to sell to replace with uh, advanced auto parts. But if I was taking a fresh look, I think it's been beat down enough that it might be interesting. Energy, uh, this is the top 30 weights. Uh, earnings estimates in the last 60 days have gone down by 8% for this year and down by 7% for next year. So um, we told you to stay out of energy at the end of last year when it, no, people were tripping over themselves to get it after a 150% rally. Um, we think there are discrete opportunities. I think natural gas and servicers only at this point. Crude's come down quite a bit. The oil stocks have not come down enough for our liking. And then defense and aerospace stocks, uh, top 30 weights estimates for next year went up 1%, 1.03% in the last 60 days, down a half percent for this year. Market looks through that. Let's move on to our questions of the week. And that is ask me anything questions. 
from Alan W. As you know, I'm a huge fan. Thank you, Alan. Appreciate that. A question on tactics regarding Cooper Standard. This is from a few days ago, I guess, when Cooper Standard was doing nothing. Seems to rally early and then get sold late. Other than VWAP, that's volume weighted average price into the close, does it make sense to just wait until 3.30 to buy or am I overthinking this? Thanks, Alan. Alan, you're not only think, overthinking this, you're thinking about the exact wrong thing. So like, the, this is a stock to own. This could be a literal 20 bagger and you're worried about for screwing around with 20 cents a day trading it. That's how people never get rich. That's, 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 how I, that's, that's the sure way not to get rich. You wanna get rich, you buy a company that you've done your work that you see a period of dislocation and you hold it and you hold it for tax benefits, you let it compound over time. And if it's a cyclical at the end of the cycle, you lay it off when everyone's excited. That's how you make money. VWAP, schmap, crap, let it go. It makes absolutely complete nonsense. It's just a way for you to lose your money and waste time. Uh, David Trujulio, um, newer viewer and listener to your contact. What do you think of the company Lumen, formerly CenturyLink? Made a little climb early this week and curious what you think about them. I know their new CEO is a former Microsoft bigwig. Um, that's just got such a legacy of being a garbage business. It would be like Credit Suisse changing their name and hoping for the best. Um, I mean, Credit Suisse, UBS will fix them because they're going to fire all the bad apples. But um, And I think UBS got a great deal on it. But um, let's see. I think Lumen has probably got a balance sheet problem, but I, let me just take a quick look. Uh, just off the top of my head, absolutely not, but let, let's just be burdened by the facts before we completely dismiss it. Revenues are declining, EBITDA positive, losing money. What's their cash flow look like? Cash flow is cut in half, but they are making money. They Free cash flow. Um, that's from divestitures. Balance sheet and cash. Uh, where's the debt? Long-term debt, this is a problem here, $20 billion with $1 billion of cash. They're gonna to have to refinance a lot of that. It's trading like it's going bankrupt. It might actually do that. Um, I think there are a lot, of, a lot better ways to make money. I mean, you could take it for a punt, maybe you get a three-bagger trade or something, but I just, this has historically not been a great business and I think that's gonna to continue to be the case. Not sure what's wrong with you know management and the way they've structured it, but it just continues to not work. So I think this has been through bankruptcy once. A anyway, uh, not for me. Like what? Life doesn't have to be that hard. Moving on. Uh, but thanks for the question, Ron Amchin. Curious how you might approach investing in India in the coming years, and if there are any particular Indian stocks you find attractive. Um, yeah. So we've covered this a bunch of times in the last few weeks. So you must be a new viewer. Thanks for tuning in. Um, uh, India is going to be our next phase after China. So three years out, four years out, we're going to be aggressively investing our China profits into India right now. Their population is a little too young. Their infrastructure is a little too uh, not so great. Uh, legal system a little bit so-so. Um, but I think that's going to be the second biggest opportunity after China for the next three years. So we're, we're a pause right now. We're focused on China, but I'm sure there are ways to make money in India right now. I think the better opportunity is going to be a few years out. Um, all right, so Bob asked a question about rubber shortages and Cooper Standard, and we covered that with the pitch book on how they're shifting to other materials. Uh, look, if the, the tire companies have a lot more to worry about than Cooper Standard when it comes to that, but they continue to innovate and they use new materials, so that's not a factor. And then finally is Max, uh, what do you think about advanced auto parts? Max, we covered that three or four times in the last three or four weeks. Um, and our view was it'll probably work if we had to own something in uh, auto parts to the public retail, we, that would be the one we would look at. 
but we don't, so we won't. Uh, we think new cars are going to be the better play for the next two years, and then used cars at some some point later. But um, uh, I think a lot of the pain is priced in there, but it's not without risk. So therefore, like Buffett says, we keep the bat on our shoulder and we pass it for the big pitches, and uh, and that's what we focus on. So. With that said, I want to thank everyone for tuning in. We're going to be back next week, same time, same place. In the meantime, oh, by the way, my golf swing came back. We won the second round of the match tournament last week, so we're very excited about that. I was literally looking at sailboats, looking for another hobby. It got that bad, and then all of a sudden, uh, my partner pointed out what I was doing wrong, little reverse pivot action, and uh, got that resolved, and it uh, feels good again. So uh comes and goes but uh right now it's come and and it feels damn good so very excited about that for those of you who have been following along uh pretty exciting uh we go into the third round in early july and then after that if we make it that'll be the finals so uh knock on wood uh for now we'll see you next week bye for now in the meantime make it a great one thanks again